Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. And you know, different guests on this program, 20 years of guests come from different backgrounds, of course. And some of the journeys, the steps from one tradition into the Catholic Church uh, can be a little easier flowing because of the similarities, still barriers to get over, uh, a lot of baggage to let go of, sometimes hard to let go of. But, but some guests have to go through bigger jumps <laughs> because of where they're coming from. Not only is the baggage difficult, the barrier is difficult to get over, but sometimes the baggage is very difficult to let go of because it's so much a part of one's former tradition. And uh, that might be the case tonight, as I find out, that, <laughs> as we hear together, hear the story of our guest tonight. Kendra Clark is a former Mormon. Mm. And uh, Kendra, welcome to the program. Thank you. Great to be here. We've had a number of to be former here. Mormons on the programs over the years, but not that many, because that many. as I kind of hinted at, it's a... It's yeah. got a lot of barriers and, and baggage to right. deal with. Right. Well, especially, you know, as a female, as a mother of four children and a grandmother, I mean, I think that the more entrenched, the longer you've been in there, of course, it can right. also add to the dynamics of the entire journey. So I definitely have a journey to share with you today. Well, so good. Yeah, let me get out of the way and invite you to take us back. Let's start well, off on the you. journey. Thank you. I was raised in Southern California, right outside of Hollywood. And my okay. family of origin is just an incredible family. I will say, to kind of paint a little bit of picture of my family, I mean, if you want to use the word or term liberal, I mean, that's just kind of an understatement of the way that I was raised. Uh -huh. My parents were more, I wouldn't call them gypsies, but I would say they're more of the, the, the teaching of, there really are no teachings. I really wasn't raised in a religious uh -huh. home at all. Um, to even go back a little further, m before I was even born, I have a brother who was five years old that was, that was flying a kite and ran into the street and he was hit by a truck. And he had a severe brain injury. And of course he was on life support and he wasn't expected wow. to live. Yeah. And because he wasn't expected to live, I then was conceived and my parents had a grave arrangement and a funeral planned and they took him off life support to pass away. And consequently, of course, I was born. Yeah. My brother survived, and so oh, really? it was wow. quite a story. Wow. And so I, I share that because it really does play a part later on in my journey. Um, I have another brother, so there's two older brothers and myself. And my parents, like I mentioned, I mean, amazing parents, uh, very loving, very close-knit family, but didn't really have or provide much no, of a... No spirituality, no, no, no. no faith, even trying no. to understand what happened to your brother, mm -hmm. there was no spiritual nothing, reflection on nothing. that. Nothing, nothing. My oh. father was raised Catholic. His father went to Notre Dame, his brother went to Notre Dame, but my father had fallen away from the church. In fact, he had a negative experience, yeah. and so what my father would share really wasn't positive, so they're really, not only wasn't there just kind of a lukewarm feeling there was an aversion so yeah. I didn't yeah. really have any opportunity to learn truth about the Catholic faith um, so it really was just kind of you know and not yeah. really spoken of and when it wasn't really wasn't in a positive light my mother however in, ended up becoming Mormon um, I was about seven or eight years old um, but even as a young child I remember feeling almost as if I was a, a spiritual being having, having a human experience. I just felt maybe possibly because of my brother, but I just felt very spiritually inclined as a small child. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what religion was. Yeah, I couldn't put your name on it. I couldn't it, put my it, name on it. I, I would find myself, I'd take a little bucket and a little scrub brush and I'd walk to the graves. There's a little fr grave site near my uh -huh. home and I'd scrub the little baby graves, you know, and, I, and my parents would say, what are you doing? Like, why are you spending your Saturdays at a baby grave? <laughs> and, and I said, well, because they, they feel God and they need to, you know, have a clean grave and, you know, just as a child would think, right. but I knew as a young child the essence of the Holy Spirit I just didn't really even know it had a name so in looking back it was very interesting my upbringing where my parents would often say to me where did you come from like why are you doing this don't you want to go out with your friends and you know and and, and get drunk you know they would even suggest that I experience the things of the world right and and I, I said well I have a lot of great friends but I don't really want to participate in that so it was really something just within that I just felt inclined to live a life not that I not that I certainly you know I have many flaws and I made many mistakes but I just felt like the path for me was one that was more dread by the holy, l l yeah. driven by the Holy Spirit versus 
the opposite. So, so when you look back on, on that spiritual presence mm -hmm. in you, you don't see that as um, something that came th as a result of something you may have seen on television or neighbors, but really with just a, a gift of the spirit within your within your heart Absolutely. There, waiting to be awakened later in life. Absolutely. It was a gift of the Spirit within the heart. I, I remember as a child asking my neighbors to take me to church or, yeah. you know, begging my parents to take me to church. And so sometimes they would, sometimes they wouldn't. Uh, I remember as a young child, I, I received a Book of Mormon because my mom was then baptized and I, and I didn't really know much about the Bible, but it was a word of Scripture in yeah. my young mind. And so I was so happy. So yes. Exactly. So when you're young, your mother becomes Mormon. She became Mormon. Of course, she was converted. I was about nine years old and she was converted and she became Mormon. Um, she was somewhat practicing. I mean, she would go on a semi-regular basis. from the neighborhood missionary exactly. stopping by? Okay. Exactly. I mean, she continued to have her habits. You know, in the Mormon religion, there's no smoking, there's no drinking. You live the word of wisdom. Uh, my mother was an amazing woman, but she continued to smoke and drink. <laughs> and, but, but yet, I believe she was converted to the standards of the church in terms of, you know, the, the eternal family, the prog eternal progression, which is another principle of the church. Yeah. And so there is, you know, some elements that she really felt. Your dad didn't follow her? Not at all. He didn't at all. He chose to just support her from afar. Right. Um, but he's, you know, an incredible man, but he is a very loving man, but he didn't really, okay. you know, And then so. you and your brothers didn't follow her right away. I did. My brothers okay. didn't. My, my special needs brother is now, you know, doing very well. He's still a five-year-old. In fact, he's almost 60 today, and he's still a five-year-old. So yeah. he's a, he's an angel. Yeah. Um, and my other brother chose not to. He lived, you know, his a normal, traditional, typical adolescent boy behavior. But I would go to church with my mom. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And, and you know, as a child, I wasn't taught the, you know, the doctrine of the church. But of course, you have friends in the church. In Southern California, it wasn't a, a large group of people that, you know, wasn't the, the majority of my neighbors would be right. Mormon. But there was a few that I would, you know, go to church with. Yeah. So you, as a young girl, you were going with your mother, you didn't understand the faith very well, so you didn't understand that this Mormon church you were going to was considered radically different than the other churches in town or exactly. anything, you just, it was a church. That's correct, it was yeah. a church, it was yeah. a place to go and pray, it was a place for me to at least feel more home in a spiritual element than I did even in my own home. Yeah. So I felt that that was where I would want to spend my Sundays. And then I was accepted to Brigham Young University. So right. <laughs> it's a turning point in Provo, Utah. And that's really where I considered my conversion to begin. Because if you know anything about Brigham Young University, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's a LDS, of course, right. Latter-day Saints sponsored. Um, it's a private university, and so they have very strict guidelines, and you live according to a very strict moral code. Um, and for me, that was very compatible. I mean, that was something that I really was attracted to. Um, in fact, I went to UCLA and Brigham Young, and I'd always find myself wanting to go back to Brigham Young because, mm -hmm. like I said, intrinsically, that's where I felt like it was a better fit for me. But that's where I really really became influenced on a deeper level. Um, the religion classes weren't about the Bible. They were about the Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price, and their additional scriptures. Yeah. So that's where I then felt the bubble became smaller and smaller and smaller in terms of I lost more of what maybe the other religions might have to offer in just the small bubble yeah. of what the LDS religion um, indoctrinated me really to accept and that was really my conversion at Brigham Young University. Often uh, we get the impression those of us have never had any experience with the Mormon Church directly that there's uh, uh, layers of understanding amongst the membership. Some have a more peripheral understanding and then as you get deeper and deeper you get to know more deeply yeah. some of these teachings um, that those on the outside don't know, but almost a, a privileged understanding. Is that true from your experience? Marcus, that's absolutely true. And it's, it's very interesting you say that because I would have to admit that as many years, about 35 years, that I was an active, temple-going Mormon mother, mm -hmm. um, 
I, I feel that as active as I was, I was so busy with all of the things I was doing, I didn't have the full understanding of some of the deeper core principles that okay. really resonate in the church. Um, I didn't really understand that until I was an adult, because when I was at Brigham Young, I was very busy in my studies. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we're encouraged to get married, which I did in the temple. Then, of course, three weeks later, I was pregnant. So I was, I was doing, you know, what I sh was called to do as a Mormon wife and a mother. Um, and then, of course, as I started to have babies, then it was just very busy. So mm -hmm. for me, it was more on autopilot, I would have to say, for about 25 years, although that auto autopilot consists of, you know, certainly daily, you know, church and of course temple going and and all the callings and associated relationships and whatnot. So as you look back to that time, very busy, living by what you understand of Mormonism, getting married, having children, mm -hmm. family, um, was was again looking back on it, was your understanding of Jesus Christ and scripture very similar to other you know non-mormon christian churches was it was it very similar you know at that time i didn't know any other non-mormon churches i really right. you know didn't understand the the doctrine associated with those those faith-based systems right. however i I didn't really think at the time it was very foreign because living in Utah, it's what everybody does. Okay. The, you know, Sundays, which is which is a beautiful um, expression of obedience. You know, the Sabbath day is kept holy. Um, but in terms of some of the the unusual doctrine, meaning we will someday be gods. We will someday, you know, men can have multiple wives in heaven. If we progress as we should, then of course we will obtain the celestial kingdom, which is the highest degree of glory. And the only way that we can do that is certainly be an active temple going, full tithe paying Mormon in married in the church. And so those things were not foreign to me um, simply because it was our almost like a different language. And yeah. it's hard to convey in words the, I don't want to use the term brainwashing because that, that is not what I mean, uh, but it's, it's simply a way of the indoctrinization that, that happens. It's, it's difficult to explain how that happens, but yet you can be very intellectual and successful and live in the world, but yet still believe that. And I, I did. Yeah. I mean, I truly did. And it isn't until now I can see with clear lenses how it is, which we'll, which we'll discuss in a moment, but um, yeah. Our, our guest is Kendra yeah. Clark. Yeah, you hate to use words like brainwashing or in, even inbreeding because of the negative connotations. Sure. But given that and, and wanting to not be offensive, that, that there is this very closed environment in which uh, uh, you don't ha have very many contacts outside, and so you're, you're taught a certain way, and then there are, especially in the Mormon world, I'm assuming from what I've heard of guests and, and yeah. my reading, is that all aspects of your lifestyle are being honed to prepare you for, as you talk about, Godhood. One of which is, I'm, and I'm guessing this, even that many of the, the personal planners mm -hmm. exactly, yeah. are really a, a, an out come of the yeah. theology of Mormonism, isn't exactly. that true? Exactly, everything, everything. It's interesting because I, I think that certainly, you know, those early pioneer traditions and early doctrine of Joseph Smith, who's the founder of the LDS faith, um, the, the prophet, if you will, right. um, those beliefs really aren't taught um, as mainstream dogma in in, the, in mm -hmm. Sunday school. They aren't even taught when the missionaries come to talk right. to you about the discussions. Those are kind of, I don't want to say they're, they're pushed under the rug, but they're not celebrated. Um, they are ever present and they are alive, but they're not discussed 
actively. So it really takes people to have more of a tabletop discussion about what it is or really opening up scripture and or the articles of faith, which really do teach and educate the members if they if they choose to dig further. And certainly, um, and we'll talk about later in our discussion, it's, you know, my transition started out of Mormonism, but very simple and a very basic understanding of what I didn't believe. But all those different ingredients into this big recipe that I accepted for many years, for three decades, um, yes, weren't actively taught. In fact, there's been times that I've talked to missionaries since I've left the church, and I just would say, you know, I'm, I'm just a Christian woman. I didn't say anything about my background being a Mormon. And I would ask them these questions, and they would circumvent the the actual question to, to kind of tie in a very superficial explanation of how families can be together forever, almost like kind of sugarcoating it. I want to go, oh, well, no, but I was told this, and then they'd kind of segue into something that was, you know, 15 layers up, you know, type thing. Yeah. So it is, it's just one of those, it's a reality, and it's, it's, okay. yeah. So you're a mom uh, with children and out of college yes. then, so how's it progress? Yes, yeah, so um, my, I have four children, I have uh, two sons and two daughters, and I was in Utah, and then what happened was, living my life, um, I went to medical school at the University of Utah in okay. Salt Lake City, and at that time, with four children, of course, I was extremely busy. So I lived in a town called Ogden, which is about an hour and a half north of Salt Lake City. So commuting to the medical school every day, if you can imagine, my days were completely full. Uh -huh. Consequently, I had to distance myself somewhat from my, not so much from my Sunday worship, but from my callings. And so what happened was when I was in my medical training, the years that I was training, I didn't really have a chance to, or I should say, I had a chance to remove myself from the church on some level. And so then when I would return on Sunday, there was a there was a pivotal moment where when I would return to church on Sunday, I was craving just discussion and dialogue on my Savior Jesus Christ. And when I would go to what is called Relief Society, which is where the women meet for one hour, the church is really comprised of three hours. We have we have a group meeting which is similar to our any type of mass, our, our sacrament, and then we have Sunday school, then we have a group women's meeting, which is called Relief Society. And during that time, I remember going week after week after week, craving just a discussion on Jesus Christ, and I didn't receive mm. it. It would be on everything peripheral. And I'm not saying Jesus Christ the, you know, didn't come up in, in the lesson on some level, but it wasn't focused on no. Jesus Christ. It was focused on, say, the Nauvoo Temple or the tithing or Joseph Smith or something else, but I, mm. I wasn't really receiving the essence of the foundation of what I felt I needed in my life. So. Right. And yeah. when, when you talked even at that point, Jesus Christ was your understanding of Christ the way we understand him as a Catholic Christian? Not, not at all. Jesus Christ and the Mormon understanding is, is simply our brother, um, is, a, is a literal son of our, of our God, and is, and Lucifer was his and brother. Lucifer is his brother as well. And so it really is a completely different Jesus Christ. And so the character of Christ is different. The makeup of Christ is different. Although my relationship with Christ, now it's, it's a lot more robust and rich. However, back in my Mormon days, it was still very rich because yeah. it's what I had. And I, so, but again, it was a different character and it was a different understanding um, and a different acceptance because as Mormons, of course, they believe that they too one day, if living according to the principles of Mormonism, they too someday can become a god. And so it negates so much of what the truth really is yeah. and that understanding really can, now I see it's skewed. Often but yeah. that theology is is close, but but not accurate. Very close. I happened to listen to a commercial about another TV show. Uh, mm -hmm. I think called Lucifer. I've never watched the program, mm -hmm. but I think it's about that. In the commercial, mm -hmm. somebody says, "Thank God," and the Lucifer character. I think he's a detective. Mm -hmm. Lucifer, you know, says, "Dad, why are you getting all the credit?" Oh. And it made me wonder. I wonder if that program has has Mormon theology behind it yeah. because we would not consider 
right. a fallen angel talking about God as Father right. in that sense. But right. that's really where Mormons come from. Our Lord Jesus and Satan are really so, human sons. Absolutely. Of God. And Lucifer is, in, I don't want to say equal to Jesus Christ, but in the term, in the sense that before he was cast out of heaven with the, with the hosts of heaven, he was a very righteous or, as we said, a brother of Jesus Christ. And so it's, that's yeah. what we're taught. And yeah. so that, you know. Yeah, really close. But in, again, if you don't have Joseph Smith's original interpretation of it, those down the line from mm -hmm. here and are not going to actually mm -hmm. pick up the differences. Mm -hmm. So there you are right. going to medical school, right? And uh, you have a hunger for Jesus. Yes, and it's just, you know, that time when I went to church, I just really, I didn't have a lot of time to really delve into a lot of the other doctrine, but I wanted to be fed spiritually by the basics. I mean, my yeah. relationship with Jesus Christ and my Heavenly Father, and and so that really that's what it boiled down to. <clears throat> and I remember it was about two weeks before Christmas, and I went to church and I thought, okay, surely the lesson will be on Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I am days away from Christmas. I'm expecting, hopefully, you know, <laughs> to have a lesson on His birth. And I remember sitting in um, the lesson. It was not. It was on the Nauvoo Temple. And I remember going to my car, and I thought, Oh, I was so discouraged. And then what happened was I decided to, unfortunately, the next two years, I had to live a completely double life. My son um, was preparing to go on a Mormon mission, and he was called to Poland. And about a year before that, I decided to drop my kids off at church, get them settled in church. I had the Mormon Bible. I then would change Bibles in the car. I would leave change Bibles, go to a Christian church, I would worship for an hour the way that I wanted to worship and felt like it was consistent with my belief system. And then before they were out of their classes, I would go back to the Mormon church and with tears in my eyes because I was so just realizing that, oh my gosh, I cannot continue this, that there must be a break. And how in the world am I going to make that break? My son is going, is preparing to go to Poland on his mission, and I'm living this double life. For two years I did that. Wow. Dropped the kids off, got in the car, went to the Christian church. The, the Catholic religion was not even on my yeah. radar, but at least in the Christian church, I praised his name. Now what kind of, a, which church, do you remember? It what, was a non-denominational non Christian, Christian church, Christian church. Yes. Okay. but it was focused on Christ. Right. And then I'd go back, change Bibles. Were you discerning the differences in what you were hearing in this church for oh, those two years? Much. And what you weren't hearing? Very much. Okay. I felt like in the Christian church, it was so, it was, it was correct for me. I mean, it was more correct than what I've been doing for the last 30 years. And so I would just feast on worshiping my Lord in this Christian church. And then I'd have to get back and hurry. And then I'd sit in the Mormon sacrament meeting, which is the group setting. Yeah. And I literally would have tears running down my cheeks because I knew that the end had to be in sight. And I didn't know how huh. or when I could pull that off. But knowing my son was going to Poland, my oldest son, I did not want anybody to be influenced by that. So uh, you did, did your husband know about it? He did. My husband likewise felt he, he supported my decision, and he, in fact, led the way. So we both decided to leave after our son went to Poland on a mission. Right. And so we then was, were very prayerful about it. It was very difficult. Um, it, it's it's very hard to describe how yeah. challenging it is because remember in the Mormon religion we're taught that those who leave um, will never obtain exaltation in fact they will be cast out and so that's something that we struggled with and for several years after leaving, I continued to struggle with that because it's just not like I flip a switch and I'm like, oh, I don't believe that. I mean, I really felt that I was leaving the church knowing that my salvation was at stake. Mm -hmm. However, I had to have faith and trust that I was being led out versus leaving with this spirit of animosity. I, 
it was um, that's a hard thing it was very dif difficult as, as I mentioned in the kind of the opening as I maybe anticipated what was going to be here is that there's barriers to get over but right. there's also this baggage so and, much baggage and that baggage of the and maybe our audience doesn't realize it that the Mormon church down the road the people there believe that they're going to become gods right. I mean, I'm sure I'm saying it right but that if they left right. that church they're giving all that up absolutely right and, and giving up the opportunity to be with their families forever because their families are in the celestial kingdom and not, not only that there's celestial terrestrial and telestial which are the three degrees of glory they call it and then there's outer dark, darkness where people that leave go to outer darkness so I will not be able to be with my Lord my family so this is um, it, it was bigger than I can express in words, but I had to go on faith. I had to go on. The, so, and both you and your husband were on the same page with this. We, we were. We were on the same page. And he asked to have his name removed from the records of the church. So he was firm, completely 100% firm. Um, when my son, the, the transition out clearly was when my son, now in Poland, serving a mission, yeah. six months into his mission, we receive a phone call and he's like, Mom, you remember the the more the missionaries can't call but three times a year. So yeah. this is when the one of the, the times he could call was Mother's Day. And he said, Mom, he said, I'm struggling as a missionary. He said, I am surrounded by Catholic families that, he said, quote, they have it figured out, end quote. And he says, I don't know what I'm going to do because I love what I'm hearing from my Polish Catholic families. Okay. And at the time, all I knew was what my father had told me. I said, that is incredible. I said, Austin, pray about it. Think about what you're doing. Pray about it. I support you. If you need to come home, you are always welcome here, of course, to come home, and we support your decision. So long story short is he did come home mm -hmm. from his Mormon mission, um, difficult for his mission president, difficult for his friends, difficult for the people in our ward, but his parents were very supportive, and he did come home. And then when he arrived home, we were about to leave for Arizona. This is in 2000. 2010. So we were prepared to move to Arizona from Utah, which was a nice time because that gave us a br kind of a break yeah. to start fresh because there was some relationships that they didn't understand. What are they doing? What's going on? What's that family's leaving? So there's a lot of you know angst about yeah. our family and who Although when you said your ward, that's like a, a parish. Parish, exactly. Uh, yeah. Very When close. you and your husband decided to make the break, you're no longer attending right. the, the ward meetings exactly. and your son comes back and he's not a welcome. Right. So it's a brand new start from it's you. It's a brand new right. start and we can then start fresh in a non-denominational church and worshiping Jesus with, you know, our full heart and our mind and our time in which we thought at the time I've like died and gone to heaven. I mean, this is exactly what I felt like my Jesus looked like, even though I. For so sure. your husband and you and your all your and children, children we all ready to go. Okay, turns out that's time for a break in exactly, the program. So there time. we are. You've yes. made a break from Utah. Yep. You've made to, mm -hmm. and you're involved with a non-denominational Christian church, and but the main reason was an intimacy with Jesus. Exactly like right. Really, that's the, the main Exactly issue. right. All right, well, let's pause right there, yes. Kendra, and we'll come right back in a moment to pick up on the rest of the story. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi, and our guest tonight is Kendra Clark. And I, I've interrupted you in the midst of this journey. Your whole family is, uh, uh, I think, a Brigham Young journey from this part of the world out there, where you've gone on a journey from Utah down to Arizona. And you're breaking with family and friends, and that's tough. It's tough. Those relationships are solid relationships, and those relationships we cherish. And it's, it's I love the, the right. Mormon people and I love what they stand for in their hearts. They're hardworking 
uh, beautiful, virtuous people, and and it's it's very challenging to, you know, to make that yeah. break for so many reasons. Well, and we will say that what's true is true. Right. What's true is exactly. true. Right. So there are things in Mormonism that are true, mm -hmm. not true because they're Mormonism, but because they got it right on the right. Like family. Exactly right. You know, there are there are issues that, that we right. share that, that are that are there at the core of that mm -hmm. is conscience mm -hmm. that is exactly. fed by God's grace. So right. we know, no, it isn't all good true. works and service. But, I mean, yeah. yeah, yeah. But I, at the end of the day, you know, my allegiance is to God and my allegiance is to truth. And so whatever sacrifices that I needed to make, I was willing to make in complete faith, yeah. not understanding or knowing at all where I would eventually land in terms of my yeah. faith. But I did know know that the Jesus that I was worshiping in the non-denominational church was really more consistent with the Jesus that I intrinsically knew as a spiritual being. Yeah. Um, and so some real challenging things happened when I moved to Arizona. My mother took her life um, at the time oh. that I left for Arizona, and it was very difficult for me. Um, and my husband, when we moved to Arizona, he had left the marriage. And so um, I had lost my mother, and my husband had left, and my two of my oldest children had gone off to college. And so here I was in Arizona. Um, grieving my mother and grieving my marriage of over 22 years, yeah. um, very, very difficult time for me. Oh. And so, um, and I was working in a very uh, demanding job at the time with children and neurosurgery, so it was very stressful for me. So I was really broken on so many levels. Um, however, I I just, I told myself, you know, Kendra, don't look to the left and don't look to the right. Just look at the cross. Just look at the cross. And, and I just continue to remain faithful in my commitment to my Savior and going to church every weekend and just giving my life to my, my, my Heavenly Father and my Savior. And I just felt like... I didn't really understand what was happening and why I had such grief in my life, but I wasn't about to give that that up, even yeah. though I didn't have a, a definition of what my faith, religion necessarily, but I wasn't about to give up my my guidance from my Heavenly yeah. Father and my Savior. So yeah. um, it was very interesting because when I first moved there, I had, I kept seeing this man, it, different places. I saw this man at the airport in a pilot outfit, then I saw the same man at the gym, and then I, I saw this man, same man all these different places, and I finally physically ran into this man at the gym, and I looked up at him, I said, I, I just saw you at the airport, like, did, are you a pilot? And I saw you in this outfit, he says, I, I'm a pilot, and I had a uniform, not an outfit, but anyhow, <laughs> long story short, he was going to be my landlord, um, because I needed to find a place to live, because my family, you know, was splitting yeah. up, and he became my my dearest friend um, his name is John and John is Catholic um, <laughs> and I also ran into other two best friends of mine, female friends, that were also Catholic. And so I just ended up rubbing shoulders with Catholic people, random Catholic people. And <laughs> why, I had no idea at the time, now I do, but at the time I thought, wow, these are great people. I think what I'll do is knowing that, you know, my father was Catholic, my grandfather was Catholic, my dear friend John's Catholic, I'm going to I'm going to actually go learn about the Catholic Church. I have no intention at all of joining the church because at the time I was relatively happy with the, no, the non-denominational church. Uh, the only issue I had is they had a lot of rock and roll um, worship, which for me I prefer more formal worship. Mm -hmm. um, I prefer more tradition, but I mean I couldn't have it all, right? So, <laughs> so that's that's really where I was. Um, this John friend of mine um, was uh, 51 years old, never married, no children, you know, and I thought, wow, that's kind of unusual, but he <laughs> became my rock, um, and I eventually married John, oh, okay. um, and he's a wonderful man, and I couldn't be happier. We. Mm. Um, you know, we certainly got married about two years later, and he did not encourage me to go to the Catholic Church. He is an incredible man of faith, but being a pilot, commercial pilot, he was gone on the weekends often, so he didn't, I really don't even think he knew where the parish was. <laughs> but my girlfriends suggested I look into RCIA, and so I thought, well, but let's, you know, if nothing else, I'll not necessarily 
prove inadequacies, but I'll check the box off that maybe it's not right for me. Mm -hmm. Because I, again, I was open to where where is right for me. But the Catholic, of course, was, you know, the Catholic religion is very well known, and I thought, well, I might as well yeah. start with the largest church and then go from there. And so in RCIA, that's really, I attended to kind of like scrutinize it, you know, with the spirit. You know, often non-denominational churches are not so much going to be anti-Catholic, but might be anti uh, that any particular church makes a difference as long as you got your faith right. Right. Exactly. You, know, you know what I'm saying? I do. That, so the idea that you would leave the non-denominational to become Catholic, why would you do that? I know, why would as, I do as that? As long as you've got, because right. they've got all this talk about baggage from a right. non-denominational standpoint, all right. the quote baggage that Catholics have accepted with Jesus, why would you want to do that? Yeah. So that might be the, 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 the right. barrier that would prevent you from moving forward. Well, really, I actually, instead of a barrier, I was drawn to it because of the Eucharist, not knowing a whole lot about the uh, Eucharist. Was or there the, a Lord's Supper at all in the Mormon faith? There was, there, there was a sacrament. So we took the bread and water, but it didn't have the same, the same significance. Okay. I mean, it was a symbol, but it wasn't clearly right. the, the, the body of Jesus. But I, I really did want a weekly something or something to take to remember my Lord. Um, and in the non-denominational church, it would be kind of a haphazard, uh, you know, occurrence every so often. But for me, knowing that the Catholics take something on Sunday <laughs> really was, this is great. I don't really know what it is, but I think that every week, at least it'll give me time to reflect on my Savior. Little did I know the significance of the Eucharist <laughs> until I went to RCIA. So when I went to RCIA, I was just like, I had so many questions. I think I drove my mentor crazy because I would email him every week of, I mean, I'm talking a lot of questions because I was a researcher. I had to understand it, but yet I most importantly wanted to be led by the Spirit. And, and I was led by the Spirit. Every time I had a question and every answer I received just validated what I thought was true. Not that I had a great, I wasn't a scriptorian by any stretch of the imagination, but validated intrinsically my spiritual nature. It was true. So it was amazing because I didn't expect it at all. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was incredible. How long journey. was the journey then to, to come to entering into the church? Well, was it, it was the, about a two year journey. Okay. It was about a two year journey. Um, and then I decided to be confirmed, and of course I was confirmed, um, the Easter Vigil, and then my husband, now he was, wow, I guess I better learn about the church, oh. <laughs> because he's a cradle Catholic. <laughs> and the questions I would ask him, he didn't have an answer to, because he he didn't really, he wasn't you know, he didn't really understand. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so and then I said. It's hard when you got a job that takes you away from, it is. It uh, is. from uh, Sunday all the yeah. time. Like he, he's such an amazing man with incredible, impeccable character. But again, it's the, the little things that he didn't really remember throughout yeah. the years. And so I kind of said, hey, we, let's got to you know, step up. I have a lot of questions. <laughs> so, so between the two of us, it's been fun learning together. Um, and now since, of course, I've been in the church, we go every week when he's in town, you know, we go together as a couple, and it's been a beautiful experience. Um, I was thinking about some of the unique Mormon theologies that are close, but no cigars, you would say, to Catholic yeah. theology, one of which is the div divinization right. of the Mormon understanding. And I'm not expecting you to be a theologian, uh, Kendra, but have you dealt with that issue, understanding the unique difference between the Mormon understanding of becoming gods right. and our Catholic understanding of divinization? Right, exactly. It is so different um, because, of course, they don't have that Trinitarian viewpoint. Um, and when Jesus Christ is a brother to Lucifer, but yet in the Godhead, but yet a separate person, but yet a God, it's very difficult to understand the Godhead. And so for me now, in my understanding of the Godhead or the Trinity, it's they're all um, forever, they're, they're eternal, but yet 
it's interesting, yeah. just, just in, crea in creation, if just take an element of creation, where in the Mormon perspective, God created the universe, kind of reorganized matter, if you will. Um, because remember, being gods, we have always been gods, we'll always be gods, and there's other gods. And so, so in, in my, my understanding now, that isn't the case. Right. Um, it was all created from our one God, and so it's so different, yeah. and it's yeah. just wrapping my yeah. head around it. And Lucifer not being the brother of our Lord, but being a, a, a created angel. Yeah. The Lord isn't created, but exactly of course right. Lucifer is a created angel who fell and rejected God. Uh, but our Lord Jesus is one uh, aspect of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. The Trinity is a mystery, and we recognize the mysterious aspect of that, but the unity of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. which would be radically different than mm -hmm. the Mormon mm -hmm. understanding of that. Mm -hmm. What parallels did you find in your Mormon background to a Catholic Church? It's a great question. In, in the people, in their hearts, I think it's been so nice to see that people are doing the best that they can. I think that even those in the Mormon faith that may not believe it all. They, they, they Oftentimes they stay in because the fallout is too great. They have great hearts. They have a yearning to do the right thing for the right reasons. And, and that's very consistent with those in my parish, that they try to do their very best and they try to live the commandments, of course. And so I think that that's been, that's been nice. In terms of, in terms of doctrine, I mean, it's different, I, you know. It's it, I haven't really thought of the similarities because right now I'm kind of feasting on the, the differences. Right. Um, and you know, when I think of similarities, of course, I mean like family, and as you mentioned yep, earlier, exactly. charity, yeah. and, and uh, 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 you know those aspects of, of living out scripture. I mean, they would mm -hmm. take scripture very seriously, but then now we get to the danger of you have scripture. But how do we interpret it? What is the, the guide through which you look at Scripture? Right. And of course, the Mormons would be through the lenses of how Joseph Smith mm -hmm. put it together in the Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. We would look at it through the authority of the church that our Lord established. Mm -hmm. uh, and talk about that a little bit. I mean, within Mormonism, it goes through changes of doctrine over the years. It does. And who decides? Where's the authority on that? I know that it changes on the issue of marriage and polygamy and also the exactly way right. it, it treated uh, blacks. Blacks in the priesthood, yeah. absolutely, 70s, certainly. Yeah, and, and so the Mormons believe that the living prophet is a a seer and a revelator and, and has the authority to act as a living prophet. And so um, the Mormons believe that since the day of Joseph Smith, there has always been a living prophet on the earth who has the discernment and the governing powers to make these changes according to however he feels yep. he is prompted by God. And so in looking back, like you mentioned, blacks in the priesthood, um, whereas what, at one point in time, it was, you know, the sign of Cain, it was the mark of Cain, which back in the Book of Mormon was, you know, was not, it was not one that, you know, is a mark. So essentially it was looked on less than. And so it definitely has, has changed throughout the years. Um, and even the fact that how the church was founded, I mean, church was founded because of the, the truthfulness of the gospel was taken from the earth, you know, in the dark ages, because the, the unrighteous, you know, the wicked popes and whatnot had, had, had forced, you know, that church to be, to be you know, taken. So um, that's the, that's the beginning of, of Mormonism. So, I mean, there's really, it's, it's very convoluted on so many levels, but, I, but looking at yeah. it from the lenses of Mormonism, it, it's been interesting to see it now as I've been out of it to where everything makes sense, if you will, because it's a story, right? Yeah. And so it makes sense and it's a very um, attractive story, especially for those who might be in a place in their life that um, may be struggling for yeah, whether a, a, a divorce or a death or a yeah. loss or a new marriage where they're vulnerable. And so this is very enticing to hear that our families can be together forever. And you know, the, the, sto the, the early discussions from the missionaries are very benign um, and it really draws them in and they don't even cover um, the, the realities of the early prophets and the early teachings of the church that are still, that are still valid today. Yeah. 
So it seems to me that um, at least different branches of the Mormon church today are trying to appear more and more normal Christian. Right. Would you say that that's true? It's absolutely true. And back to my brother, my special needs brother, who yeah. my parents, my father had passed away several years ago. So um, now he's, I'm, he's my responsibility, um, my privilege. And w one of the other areas that really was very challenging for me to accept was the fact that my brother, my perfect angel brother, couldn't be in heaven um, because he wasn't Mormon. And so that was a struggle for me because, yeah. you know, I thought we clearly, I just don't think we're really good enough to make, I just don't, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a mere mortal, you know, I, yeah. I just I just don't think that really makes sense that I can earn my way to heaven. Um, and I, I certainly don't think it makes sense that my angel brother who is truly an innocent child, how could he not? And I know that they have that practice where they baptize those that have passed away, um, but I, I had a difficult time reconciling that unless you're Mormon, that you cannot obtain exaltation yeah. with, with God. And so as much as I lived it and I was an active temple goer and I, and I still, I still respect those those um, yeah. very sacred practices and promises that I made in the temple, I respect those and I don't repeat those and I revere those out of respect for the church. Um, it was a challenge for me to reconcile that. Yeah. It's very difficult for me to reconcile that. I just don't think a, my God would say, you can't come in or you can come in because of what you did um, so or didn't do. Uh, didn't so. do or especially if it, if it was not his fault at all, right? I know, yeah, I yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, in all, yeah. that whole aspect. Um, you're, I, I don't know the background, so uh, your son that was a missionary, did he, yeah, good he question. came in and everything? And with so, you? My, so my son, we went to the Catholic Church together. Um, he loves the Catholic faith, and so we would attend um, consistently. He is now, he is in his training to be F-18 fighter pilot for the Navy, oh. so he is a pilot for the Navy. Um, what happened is he met a lovely girl in college. He had a football scholarship in Utah. Um, and he met a lovely girl in college in Utah who's Mormon, <laughs> and he has decided to get married in the Mormon temple, mm -hmm. and he recently got married in the Ogden temple with her in August. Right. And so he has chosen to go back to the Mormon faith. Right. He has great reverence for the Catholic faith. In fact, he oftentimes will say, when I'm visiting you, Mom, we're going to the Catholic church. So he is a wonderful, wonderful, obedient, faithful believer and he has a dear wife and I support him 100%. He understands what I believe and he respects it and I respect him and what mother wouldn't want a child to be active in a strong faith based, based you know, belief. I mean, I, I have such great respect for him and know that, you know, if and when, he, you know, the Holy Spirit prompts him, he will act accordingly and I have to let let the Let Spirit God lead work in his, his magic. Life. Yes. How would you help uh, Catholic viewers whose um, maybe don't know their faith as well as they ought to, and maybe their children don't know the faith as they ought to? How would you help them resist the missionaries that stop on their door and uh, have a very Christian sounding message? Sure, sure. You know, I, I, in living my my life, I'm in my 50s right now, and I've I've lived on both ends. I would say, really, I would say maybe instead of re resisting a relationship with the missionaries, I would say em embrace a relationship with the missionaries on, on the terms of allowing them to hear your your testimony, um, because of course they're there to proselyte and to share what they have. And I would say, come in, let me, you know, I would l certainly, I'll give you a moment to share, but allow me then to share. And then understand, kind of see where their radar is. You know, if they are, you know, hey, I'm sorry, I don't really have time to listen to your story, but I'm here to sh give you a Book of Mormon, um, then I would suggest say, you know, if you're gonna leave a Book of Mormon, then please allow me to leave 
maybe some literature with you. Not that I'm here to convert you necessarily, but I just want you to understand where I'm coming from and how then that would be, I think, a healthy dialogue so that they understand other than, of course, what they're there to teach. And I think that that builds relationships. And that's, I think, what our Heavenly Father, our God, our Savior would want us to do in terms of rather than maybe deny a relationship, then maybe have a fruitful relationship that can only maybe plant a seed in these young missionaries at some point. Because my son, if I, yep. if my son wasn't welcomed into these Catholic families, my son would never know about the Catholic faith. Right. And look what it's done to his old mama. Yeah. <laughs> we got an email from Chad from Wisconsin. Asked a question that's kind of connected. Uh, what do you think are some poignant questions to ask a Mormon to get their, get them to reconsider their beliefs and be open to dialogue? Yeah. That's a great question. I think just to have them tell their story and kind of, I, I think, seek first to understand and then, of course, to comment. So I would actually have them tell their story of their family, have them tell their story of their testimony. Have the, the, the missionary. missionary? Correct. Yeah, yeah. That way you can understand where they're coming from. Because if they're from Utah and they really know nothing about other faiths, then of course it gives you a, uh. then the opportunity to ask the right questions. Then for example, say they're from New York City and they were raised Presbyterian and they are a new convert to the Mormon church, then of course you have a different question. So I would say first listen to understand where they're coming from because not all Mormon missionaries are from Utah. Many missionaries have very diverse yeah. histories and I would say first listen and I believe the Holy Spirit will prompt you to ask the questions that are specific to that particular individual whether they're female or male. And I think you're also subtly encouraging the, the Catholic to know their faith pretty well, mm -hmm. to learn their faith a little better. Mm -hmm. and, and, and be prayerful. And be prayerful. Be prayerful. The Holy Spirit, He will guide. Okay. Yeah. Tricia from PA writes, from what I know, Mormons seem to have such a great support structure and wholesome family environment. I'm considered joining the Mormon church so my family and I benefit from all they have to offer. Though, of course, I've heard negative things about Mormonism, and so I'm not quite sure what to do. What's your encouragement to Tricia? Well, certainly the Mormons do have that strong faith-based, family-based system. Um, I would encourage Tricia to really consider Catholicism because <laughs> I've lived in both, and we have that robust, solid, integrative framework that allows families to worship together, that has that strong family foundation, that believes that the family is a strong, vibrant network, and those relationships are be, to be nurtured. So I would say just maybe attend RCIA or look on a proper and appropriate w internet um, right web page. Um, your web page or Catholic Answers is where I received many of my answers. And even in Catholic Answers, then you can really see a lot of Mormons, of course, share their testimonies. And you can right. then contrast and compare. But I would say, let's just wait and just give Catholic Answers a try or give some, you know, visit with some families in the parish that really have a strong family network and then allow the Holy Spirit to guide you. But I would suggest that she try that. Like we mentioned earlier, truth is truth. So when we mm -hmm. see the strong family network in a Mormon church, it can be enticing if from where we're coming, it isn't as strong as it ought to be. That's right. And, but that could be true in a lot of different religions and faiths. True. So that doesn't make that faith mm -hmm. authentic just because they got something right there. Absolutely. So as you said, number one, let's look at what the church really teaches about family. There's, That's there's right. no there's no religion out there that is as deeply committed to the family, to the human person, to the value of life as the Catholic faith. So we got to recognize the truth of that. That's right. And then second, we got to start living it so that our families and our marriages and our relationships right. are good models of that. Absolutely. For, for all to see. Sure. Um, again, as let's say, and it happens sometimes, that a, that a Mormon might be watching right now. Mm -hmm. With maybe one minute to go, what would you say to that Mormon? Just one last word to encourage right. the Catholic faith. You know, in the beginning, it seems like there's many reasons not, not to leave because it's it's real, it's tangible. We have relationships. You're going to hurt feelings. It's going to, it's, it's difficult. But I would just say, 
keep your eye focused on the cross. Keep your eye focused on your Savior because He will lead you out to truth. He will help you find truth. And at the end of the day, there's really nothing else that matters because all of those other peripheral reasons aren't why we're here on earth. Mm -hmm. We are here to worship our Lord and Savior. We are here to give glory to Him. And the way to do that is to do it through truth. And that's what got me through the, the clouds. And I lived in the clouds for a very long time until I finally came home when I was, when I was confirmed. Um, and there's clouds, but you just have yeah. to hold on and know that by faith you will make it. You will make it. So. All right, Kendra. Thank you very thank much you for having me today. For joining us thank on you. the program and sharing your journey. God bless you and your you. continued you. journey. Thank you. And uh, as a caretaker of your of your brother. Thank you. We pray appreciate that, that. Especially the unique challenges that that offer, and uh, and also for your own witness. I do want to tell the audience that Kendra's written story is on our website. If you go to www.chnetwork.org. That's the website for the Coming Home Network. You can read her whole story written out, uh, <laughs> as well as hear the Journey Home program. So thank you, Kendra. My pleasure. And thank you for joining us on this episode of the Journey Home. I do pray that Kendra's journey is an encouragement to you. God bless you. See you next week.